Good morning. We uh, finished yesterday having our year 2000 Synod Assembly at which we elected a new bishop. The process for electing a bishop is a somewhat drawn out one in the sense that we had five different times that people voted. They're called five ballots. The first ballot is a time when you get a blank sheet of paper and you can vote for anyone you would like to have be the next bishop. And there were a total of 64 different pastors who were nominated in that process. The second ballot then is of those people who are willing to stand for election. So that list of 64, a majority of the people dropped out. They did not want to be considered any further. And so there were, I don't know, about 19 people on the second ballot. Of those you next go to the top seven. And the top seven were Pastor Charles Gruby, who actually grew up part of his life here in Schuylkill County. He graduated from Tri-Valley back in 1977, I believe. Christopher DeForest, Susan Ruggles, Nelson Kionis, Rebecca Mitika Conlon, Ryan Hirsch, and Martha Seip. So the the seven were a very diverse group. As you heard, three of the seven were females, and one of the males, a person of of, um, African-American background through um, Hispanic, uh, through the Hispanic world. And at the end of the second ballot, Charles Gruby was by far the top vote-getter. He had 164 votes. The next highest had 65. The third ballot was then taken using only those top seven. You had to vote for one of them. In the meantime, all of these seven people were given the opportunity to make a statement about who they are and to answer several questions. So people saw those uh, responses and then voted. And on the next ballot, the three who remained, the top three, were again Pastor Gruby, but he had dropped to third place. Christopher DeForest and... um, Ryan Hirsch, thank you. Now, Ryan, at the end of the second ballot, had only 21 votes. He was, he just made the cutoff. He had 21, Martha Seip at 19. But he then ended up in second place. And so, after Pastor Gruby was knocked out, it finally came down to a vote between Ryan Hirsch and Christopher DeForest, and Christopher DeForest won. He has only been a pastor for about nine years. His current call, he has been in for about a year, and that is the Trinity Lutheran Church in Kutztown, which is the church where my father grew up in. So... um, That's the story on the electing of a bishop. We also had events in the assembly to mark the retirement of our current bishop, whose name is Samuel Zeiser. Regarding Bishop Zeiser, the decision was made by the Synod Council to honor him by setting up a a scholarship fund in his name to help pastors who are, and and deacons, people who are preparing to be those roles. And so um, 
that fund was set up and congregations are welcome to contribute to the fund. The principal will not be spent, it's the interest that will go. And uh, my church in, other church in Buck Run is planning to bring that up at their congregational meeting. Another issue that was brought before the assembly was a pastor in the Poconos, and he also wanted to do more to help support people studying to be pastors. And his resolution, which was adopted, calls for every church to give $5 a month for three seminarians, so that would be $15 a month, $180 a year. And that um, was also adopted. There's been a big concern about the number of people who are available as pastors and the cost that it takes. I've told some of you before, I had a friend who came out of seminary owing $172,000 in debts. That's for college and seminary. And so there are efforts being made to try to reduce that kind of expense. So that's my, re my report. Um, Mr. Dillman, as the Secretary of the, Tre of the Synod, gave a report, and he also attended the assembly. Is there anything you would like to add? Thank you. As I'm the Secretary of the Synod, and so I have responsibilities throughout the Assembly. So the Bishop and I and the Vice President, who helps to conduct the meeting, uh, and the Bishop's main assistant were there at the Synod office, plus probably twice as many technical people who ran the cameras. I'm sitting at a desk. Now, we're all separated because of COVID. So the bishop has a podium. I have a table. The vice president has a stand of her own. And for each of us, there's a camera focused on us so we can do our part when the time came. It was very interesting. Many of us were skeptical of, can we do this? But the fellow who was elected bishop had a background in business setting up conferences. And he assured us, yes, we can do this. Yes, we can do this. And indeed, we, we did. And it was interesting. I, had, I did not run for bishop. I had six votes. I discouraged people from voting for me, uh, including by sending out an essay to all the pastors of the synod telling them I would not be a candidate. So I, I could have been one, but um, for family reasons, I did not let my name go into the second ballot. Okay, anyone else have something to report? Yes, Mr. Hampton. I'm sorry, I could not hear. <laughs> Eleven or twelve shoeboxes so far. Oh. Okay, so let them know if you would like to give a box. 
and uh, then what Dave was talking about, individuals' c contributions, not an entire box, but things that would go into a box or a financial aid to help with the boxes. These are boxes put together, given to children throughout the world. Okay, thank you. Yes, Winnie. Okay, thanking for the gift cards. Anyone else? The council meets today after church, and the catechetical class meets today after church. Okay. If nothing further, our entrance hymn is A Mighty Fortress, this being Reformation Sunday, a time to remember Martin Luther and the reformers of the 1500s. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel. And bestow on the church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to John, the eighth chapter. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham, and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, You will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. So that every mouth may be silenced. So that every mouth may be silenced. That is a verse from today's second reading, Romans chapter 3, verse 19. 
Paul is talking about people who are being confronted by God's law, a law so devastatingly straight and true that no excuses are allowed. You are guilty. There is nothing more to say. But that's not the way the world usually works, is it? We can come up with all sorts of excuses. I should have kept a list of what I've been told concerning why our tenants can't pay rent. One was that the lady of the house might have a brain tumor. That was almost a year ago. Or they had to help their daughter pay for a new roof where she is living. Or they applied for a grant, but it will take a long time. Or they mailed the job application, but to the wrong address. On the internet, I found this list of reasons people have given for not coming into work. It's my dog's birthday. The neighbor's cat was sleeping in my car, so I had to turn around. I use spoiled toothpaste. My fortune teller told me I can't come into work today. I got a paper cut. My fish died. I think I've caught a monkey disease from my trip to the zoo. But can you always be sure that it is a fake excuse? Like those several weeks ago when I called in to cancel a meeting because my front left wheel flew off the car. A worthless excuse? No, it was true. A real reason for not showing up that I just learned will cost me $2,400. Or the man from Argentina from whom I bought a Bolivian coin in May. By July, the coin, the coin had not yet arrived. And so I was doubting this transaction. But the man insisted that the coin was in the mail, but the mails were slow because of the virus. I had given up all hope of ever seeing that coin, but lo and behold, it just came on Friday. His excuse wasn't wrong after all. It was a true reason. Excuses. We're always trying to justify ourselves, and sometimes the excuses we give are authentic, while other times they may be a stretch at best or an outright lie at worst. In our lesson today, the issue isn't about how to deal with landlords or people who are waiting for us in meetings or companies that sell Bolivian coins. Here in our lesson today, the issue deals with us and God. Us and God. God tells us what God expects of us. And before God, we cannot make any fake excuses. We are guilty for not always meeting God's expectations. Our love and charity aren't pure and unlimited. Our deceits are only too real. There is nothing more for us to say. So is that the end of the matter? Guilty as charged. Not according to our reading from the book of Romans. Quote, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All have sinned. No one can talk his or her way out of this. So, we are justified by his grace. Our standing before God comes through God's mercy, God's grace. like we did a few weeks ago with another verse. Let's see how several different translations express this specific sentence. The Good News Bible. By the free gift of God's grace, 
all are put right with him through Christ Jesus who sets them free. The Common English Bible. But all are treated as righteous freely by his grace because of a ransom that was paid by Jesus Christ. The Message Bible. God did it for us. Out of sheer generosity, he put us right in standing with himself. A pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in and restored us to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by means of Jesus Christ. Finally, the New Living Translation. Yet God freely and graciously declares that we are righteous. He did this through Jesus Christ when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. Notice that in these more free translations, as well as in the more traditional wording that we have in Celebrate, the person who is doing the acting is God. We are silent, so God acts. We are helpless. So God takes the initiative. In other words, God saves us. This passage from Romans chapter 3 is a very basic passage. It deals with our relationship with God. What is that relationship like? Who does the most to maintain that relationship? The passage reminds us all that, yes, indeed, we have a relationship with the Lord God Almighty. And it's a good and solid relationship. But it's based on God's love, <clears throat> excuse me, love and forgiveness and generosity, not on what we do. From our side, all we can do is remain silent. None of this Hey, God, see how great I am. It's a matter of, here I am, God. No excuses, no good reasons. I am what I am. Save me. And so God does, because of God's mercy shown in Jesus Christ. A hymn that expresses Ideas such as these is an old favorite, just as I am without one plea. It was written in 1834 by a woman in England who was an invalid for the last 50 years of her life. Her name was Charlotte Elliot. One book about Christian hymns explains her spiritual struggles in this way. Quote, the hymn was born out of the author's personal spiritual experiences. Although a daughter of the church brought up in a pious home, it seems that Miss Elliot had never found true peace with God. Like so many other seeking souls of all ages, she felt that people must do something themselves to win salvation instead of coming to Christ as helpless sinners and finding complete redemption in him. When a famous clergyman of the time once visited her family, he became her spiritual guide, telling her, quote, you have nothing of merit to bring to God. You must come as you are, a sinner, to the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, end quote. Years later, so the story goes, she was reflecting on this spiritual advice when she wrote this hymn. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, Thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve.
Because thy promises I believe. O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Today is Reformation Sunday, a time when we remember Martin Luther and the Reformation of 500 years ago. Today's second reading was an important theme in Martin Luther's life, too. Note the introduction to the reading in Celebrate. Paul's words stand at the heart of the preaching of Martin Luther and other Reformation leaders. No human beings make themselves right with God through the works of the law, meaning the laws or demands of God like the Ten Commandments. We are brought into a right relationship with God through the divine activity centered in Christ's death. This act is a gift of grace that liberates us from sin and empowers our faith in Jesus Christ. That is an important lesson for us to learn. Instead of trying to make excuses and find reasons for our shortcomings, we need instead to be found by our Savior. Amen. We confess our faith using the Nicene Creed, page 84. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds with the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Renew and inspire the church in the freedom of the gospel, O God. Where the church is in error, reform it. Where the church speaks your truth, strengthen it. Where the church is divided, unify it. Ignite in us the working of the Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, as the earth changes, as mountains shake and the waters roar, May we care for this planet as a holy habitation for all living things. Sustain all peoples and lands recovering from natural disasters of any kind. Lord, in your mercy, guide areas of the world divided or traumatized by conflict, especially in our own land. Free all from slavery and human trafficking and protect all in harm's way. Lord, in your mercy, 
Release those living in bondage to deaths, chronic pain, or addiction. Grant healing touch to those who are ill, especially those we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, in this family of faith, we give thanks for courageous voices that have remained firm in their commitment to the one who frees us from sin and death. Centered in your grace, unify us in the hope of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy, even in death, you free us and give us a place in your house. We give thanks for our ancestors who have shown us truth and freedom, especially Martin Luther and those who work for the renewal of the church. Lord, in your mercy, Listen as we call to you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray as our Lord taught, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.